So our featured guest speaker today is uh, somebody many of y'all know, and many of y'all have had uh, interviews with her, uh, Amanda Schutz. Hope I pronounced that right. <laughs> so Amanda is, uh, so since uh, November, she's been here in Houston studying. She came from the University of Arizona, um, where she's, uh, so she's getting her PhD in sociology through the study of free thought organizations, specifically the ones here in Houston. So since November, she's been here with us, uh, attending many, many of our events, um, almost all of them really, and uh, interviewing um, many of us as well for her research. Um, so yeah, so uh, here to share about her research today and uh, its potential, uh, why she's doing it, and what her findings may uh, reveal about us and uh, what kind of impact they may have on the field of sociology. So uh, please give a hand to our guest speaker, Amanda Schutz. PhD candidate at the University of Arizona, uh, doing my PhD in sociology, and today I'm going to be talking about my dissertation research, which is very much a work in progress. Um, so I've been doing qualitative sociological research here in Houston since November, like Vic said. I've completed about 70 ethnographic observations, which Basically means I've been doing a lot of eating and drinking and hanging out with, <laughs> hanging out with atheists and humanists and, um, and learning a lot of new things. Uh, and I've done over 50 in-depth interviews. Uh, these interviews that I'm doing are very informal, conversational. Uh, they vary in length. Some of them, you know, go by really quickly. They're nice and concise. You know, we're done in 30, 40 minutes. Uh, my longest interview was four and a half hours. So uh, very quite a bit. And um, I believe... Vic is going to be sending out a request for more interviews through the uh, Humanists uh, of Houston meetup page, so keep an eye out for that if you're interested in being interviewed. I know there are a few people here that I've been in contact uh, through email that uh, we still need to get something worked out. I've been out of town, but now that I'm back, I'm, I'm going to get back in the flow of things. Um, so please catch me after the meeting if you would like to be interviewed for this project especially if you're a woman, and especially if you're not white. <laughs> All right. So this presentation is going to be divided basically into two parts. Uh, first, I'll talk a little bit about myself as a researcher, so my motivations for pursuing sociology in the first place, why I decided on this topic of research specifically, uh, non-believers and, and non-religious uh, communities, and why I chose Houston as a field site. Uh, and second, I am in the middle of this data collection process right now, but I'll be talking about some of the things I've learned since I've been here in Houston. Uh, so this research is very inductive. This means that uh, although I did come to the field with certain expectations of what I thought I'd see and um, some things that I thought would be interesting while I'm here, a lot of my conclusions are going to be drawn uh, after completing the research rather than looking for evidence to confirm fully formed uh, hypotheses. So we're starting off with observations uh, and then later making uh, conclusions and ending with, with a theory. Okay. A little bit about myself. I'm from a very small town called Damat, Indiana. Uh, this is a rural community about 70 miles outside of Chicago, a population of fewer than 4,000. Uh, very conservative, Republican, not very diverse, uh, almost entirely white, almost entirely uh, Protestant, Christian. And I was raised in a household that was in some ways middle class and in some ways uh, very much working class. Uh, so even though I always did pretty well in school, I was never really encouraged to question a lot of things. Uh, you were told to obey authority, uh, do what you're told, listen to the rules, this is just the way things are, very working class values. And I really didn't start questioning the way things are uh, until I went to college and started taking courses in sociology. So I did a 
presentation at the Sugar League Forum uh, for HOH last month about sociology as a field of study. Uh, sociology as a field of study and kind of its compatibility with humanism as an ideology, but uh, for those of you who were, who were at that presentation, I'm pulling from my lecture notes here, uh, sociology can be defined as the scientific systematic study of society and group behavior. Uh, so social research is relevant to social theory. It incorporates significant amounts of appropriate evidence that is purposefully collected. And its conclusions are based on some form of systematic analysis of the entire body of relevant evidence. Uh, so this is simple enough, but I didn't know what sociology was when I took my first course. Uh, and for those of you who can't see this little cartoon here, uh, at the bottom it says, uh, it's a father talking to his son who says, I'm a social scientist, Michael. That means I can't explain electricity or anything like that, but if you ever want to know about people, I'm your man. <laughs> All right, so this is an incredibly broad field of study. Uh, so wherever human interaction occurs, sociologists are there to study it, uh, to describe it, and attempt to understand it. Uh, and this includes uh, symbols, how we use symbols and language to communicate, um, how power and resources are distributed among groups of people, usually unequally, uh, how social class affects interaction and behaviors. Uh, how race affects interaction and behaviors. How gender affects interaction and behaviors. <coughs> how social institutions like uh, the family, systems of education, uh, the economy, mass media, uh, and religion help a society meet its basic needs and how many of these things are socially constructed. Uh, so symbols are socially constructed. Race is socially constructed. Gender roles are socially constructed. Religion, socially constructed. And while reducing everything down to a social construction is overly simplistic, this idea that these things don't exist because they're inherently real or true, but rather because a large enough group of people have come to agree that they're real or true, uh, to me this was figuratively mind-blowing. <laughs> so, religion is socially constructed. Uh, one of the first sociologists, Emil Durkheim, wrote that religion was nothing more and nothing less than a society worshiping itself. It's a manifestation of whatever a society finds important or valuable. So God didn't create man, man created God. So I'm not sure if I accepted these pronouncements right away, but in uh, Sociology 101, I was presented with this fact that I could not ignore and could not forget, which is that virtually every single culture that has ever existed on this planet uh, has a religion. Uh, many of them developed independently of one another, many of them having some pretty significant themes in common, uh, and many groups believing that their religion is the one true. Uh, religion and that all of the others are wrong. Uh, and so the for the first time, this really dawned on me uh, that the only reason that I followed the religion I did was because I had been socialized to do so from a very young age and encouraged to continue doing so into adult, uh, adulthood. Uh, but had I been born into a different family, uh, in a different country, I probably would have been socialized into a different religion and believed it uh, with equal intensity. So between finishing college and beginning my graduate uh, studies in sociology at the University of Arizona, I went through a pretty gradual trans uh, transformation, which I'd imagine uh, many of you here are probably familiar with, uh, in that I went from this fundamentalist Christian to, well, I'm a progressive Christian, to, well, maybe I'm spiritual, but not religious, <laughs> to, to well, see, uh, I, I'll call myself agnostic, that's fine, uh, and then finally, and somewhat reluctantly, uh, to atheism. Uh, and then as my personal non-religious identity became more solidified, um, I became more interested in learning more about non-believers as a social group, uh, and a group that's becoming increasingly actualized and well-organized. 
So when I started graduate school, I had to start thinking about a research agenda. And I found myself really drawn to this topic of non-religion, and I wanted to learn more about other people who didn't believe in God either. Uh, so for my master's thesis, I interviewed 39 atheists in Tucson, Arizona, which is where the U of A is, uh, about their experiences coming out atheist, how they lost their faith or came to call themselves atheists, uh, who they tell, who they don't tell, how people react um, upon learning that they're an atheist, uh, how being an open atheist affects their everyday lives and interactions with others. And I found a lot of similarities between this process of coming out atheist and coming out LGBT. Uh, so both groups experience a lot of the same stages of identity development and disclosure, which I think suggests that both groups can go about handling the stigma of identifying as LGBT or atheist in similar ways. Uh, and one way to handle the stigma or to, to alleviate it is coming out making people aware that they actually know someone who is a good, caring, moral person uh, and also an atheist. Uh, because most people do have pretty negative opinions uh, about atheists, and people who hold those opinions report not actually knowing anyone who's an atheist, or at least not knowing that they know someone uh, who's an atheist. And this is exactly how the LGBT community has really increased its rates of acceptance in the past uh, several decades. So when you learn that you know someone personally who is a member of this stigmatized group and it's a person that you know and like and you know that it's a good person, your opinions toward that group start to improve. Uh, so I mentioned a little earlier uh, that qualitative research, the type of research that I'm doing, tends to be inductive. So you do your observations first, and you come to develop your theories and conclusions later. And what I noticed when I was transcribing my interviews and encoding them for my this master's research that I had done, uh, that there were several significant um, gender differences in the atheist experience that I hadn't been looking for um, while I conducted the interviews. Uh, so for instance, even though all of uh, the people that I interviewed were atheists, they identified as atheists, they didn't believe in God. The women that I spoke to were much more likely to use euphemisms when talking about their non-belief. They would say they were agnostic, they're not religious, they just don't go to church. Uh, women were more likely to talk about receiving pressure from uh, family to go to church. They were more likely to say that other people don't take them seriously when they say that they don't believe in God. So people would say things like, uh, you know, you'll grow out of it, you'll come around to it eventually, you'll figure it out. Uh, and they were more likely to have their roles as decent mothers questioned. Uh, so women would claim that other people thought that they were failing to raise their children properly if they didn't take them to church on Sundays. Men, on the other hand, never talked about their role as a father as uh, being questioned because they were atheist. Uh, men were much more willing to use the word atheist around other people. They were more likely to engage in confrontational conversations with other people about religion. Uh, they're more likely to talk about their atheism as being a problem on the dating scene, too, which I thought was really interesting. So, you know, statistically, women are more likely to be religious than men. Uh, so some single men express difficulties finding uh, dates with women who are okay with dating an atheist. And a lot of these differences and experiences, I think, are the result of very deeply held cultural attitudes uh, about what it means to be male or female, uh, about the appropriate roles uh, and behaviors for men and women. Uh, so this is a paper that I'm working on with a uh, professor at U of A. And anyway, so I had such a good experience doing this research for my master's thesis. I really enjoyed going um, going to these, these meetups, these atheist meetups, and meeting people, talking to them, having these one-on-one -on -one conversations, and I decided I wanted to continue that and do something similar uh, for my dissertation. Um, but then I had to decide what, what I was going to do. So about two years ago, a friend of mine at the U of A, who knew I was doing research on atheists, sent me this CNN article. 
That's uh, called Church Without God by Design. It was basically about atheist churches, which is actually the first time I heard this phrase. Um, sometimes they're referred to as godless congregations. Uh, so the article talked about um, a few of these groups. They talked about the uh, humanist community at Harvard, and there were a couple people involved in this community that maybe you're familiar with. Chris Stedman wrote a book called uh, Faithiest, uh, How an Atheist Found Common Ground with the Religious. Uh, Greg Epstein there uh, in the middle wrote a book called uh, Good Without God, What a Billion Non-Religious People Do Believe. Uh, and Greg is also one of the four experts on a &E's Married at First Sight, <laughs> uh, where he helps match up couples who agree to get married and meet each other for the first time at the altar. <laughs> it's, it's a really fascinating show. So it's like, it's like The Bachelor, but it's better and more genuine. Um, this is what I do when I'm not working on a dissertation. <laughs> But anyway, what's really interesting too about the show is they actually do refer to him as the humanist chaplain at Harvard. Um, they, they call him that on the show and they don't really explain what that means and they usually just refer to him as a like, spiritual advisor. Um, but still, he's, uh, Greg has written a few posts about this on his blog at the, the humanist community there at Harvard. So humanism becoming more mainstream. And the article that I, the CNN article I mentioned also talked about uh, Jerry DeWitt's uh, atheist church um, in Louisiana, his former Pentecostal pastor, um, who Vic had said has, he's been at HOH events before and he'll be coming back uh, again in the future. He wrote uh, this book called Hope After, After Faith, uh, which you guys give, you must have a stockpile here somewhere. I feel like you guys gave this book away, it should draw a prize for it. Anyway. Um, finally, another atheist church, godless congregation, whatever word you want to use for it, uh, that maybe you've heard of is the Sunday Assembly, which has been launching franchises. It started in London, and they've been launching franchises around the UK and around the US. Um, so it looks a lot like a church here, only instead of hymns, they sing queen songs. <laughs> <laughs> That's the lyrics on the projection screen there. It's a Queen song. Uh, so I found this idea of organizing around a lack of belief in God intriguing before this, but after hearing about these specific organizations uh, that were starting to get mainstream attention, I started thinking more about the different types of events and activities that were becoming available to non-believers. Uh, and I think what these so-called atheist churches uh, have really done is help to demonstrate that non-believers are a much more diverse group of people than you might think they are. And that different types of non-believers might want different things out of the organizations they join if they decide to join one at all. Uh, boring theoretical stuff. Um, so my dissertation as a whole is rooted in questions about stigma and identity and organizations. So when you do this type of research, you don't just want to be, you know, visiting these events, talking to people, describing what's happening, your dissertation committee also wants you to show that it's relevant to social theory. That this is something that's not just interesting, but also important and significant. Uh, so why is this research significant? Um, so I mentioned a little earlier that social perceptions of uh, atheists show that out of a long list of minority groups, uh, atheists tend to be the least liked, the most distrusted, People don't want to vote for atheists, they don't want their children marrying atheists. Uh, sometimes, depending on the survey, Muslims will rank a little lower, but uh, atheists are pretty consistently uh, at the bottom of that list. So there's a stigma attached to claiming a non-religious identity and specifically calling yourself an atheist. Uh, and there have been several recent qualitative studies of atheism and non-belief that have explored identity issues. Uh, so this includes how people become atheists, uh, how they handle disclosing their identity, how they uh, come to see this stigmatized identity as a positive thing uh, from which a non-religious ideology can develop. Uh, and the more we understand, I think, um, about a group of people, the more we're able to dispel the myths and misconceptions uh, about them. 
so what my research kind of adds to this is the role that organizations might help, uh, might play in helping uh, people manage the stigmatized identity. So I think that this type of involvement, being involved in a, in a group like HOH, uh, can be a significant variable in the atheist experience. Uh, so that's kind of what I'm focusing on today, is this idea of organizational identity. Uh, that just like individuals, groups and organizations need to answer questions about uh, who we are and who do we want to be in order to successfully interact and communicate uh, their values and goals to others. Okay, so here are a few of the questions that I had when I started this research. So for instance, does being involved in a non-religious organization provide non-believers with certain knowledge or resources that help them come to terms with this stigmatized identity and, or, or uh, maybe enable them to more competently and confidently talk about their lack of belief with others? Uh, additionally, I don't just think that belonging to an organization matters, but I think belonging to a specific type of organization also matters. So certain characteristics and experiences might draw a non-believer to a particular organization or a particular type of event, uh, and I'm interested in finding out what those are. And I also suspect that there are reciprocal relationships between individuals and groups and organizations. If an organization can affect an individual, I think that individuals can also affect the characteristics and activities of an organization. So identity is not static. Um, it's not static for individuals. It's not static for organizations. Uh, in fact, some organizational theorists would say that uh, the organizations need to be more flexible uh, in how they define themselves than individuals do because they need to be able to survive precarious social, political, and economic conditions if they want to continue uh, attracting members and continue being relevant. Uh, but right now, I'm going to focus on the organizational types that I've been observing among the free thought community in Houston. And I'm actually going to be focusing exclusively on HOH because I think that HOH does a great job of displaying multiple identities and offering a lot of different events and activities that fulfill the needs of different types of non-believers who might be looking for different things. Uh, so just like individuals, organizations uh, can have multiple identities. So as an individual, you can be an atheist, a democrat, a mother, an engineer, all at once. But at any given moment, one of those identities is probably going to be stronger or more salient uh, than another. And I think you see similar things happening in organizations, and hopefully that'll make more sense here. Uh, but before I talk about all of the wonderful things that HOH is doing, I want to address the most frequent question that I've been hearing while I'm here. Um, just why Houston? I'm at the University of Arizona. I'm from Indiana. I'm not from Houston. I don't know anyone in Houston. Why am I here? Uh, and the simple answer to that is that there are a lot of non-religious organizations in Houston that have large memberships. Uh, they have a lot of different types of events on the calendar. Um, also, it, it helped. Um, I'm teaching at the University of Arizona, but I'm teaching online, so I didn't have to be in Tucson to do that. I got a little bit of grant money to cover traveling and accommodation, so I was not constrained to being in Tucson, so I really wanted to make sure that I was in a place where there was a lot of action happening. Um, so there's a lot of stuff happening in Houston, but why is that? And I'm going to answer this a little more thoroughly by talking a little bit about John, who was one of my interview respondents. His name's not really John, that's a pseudonym. But, um, but I think his story really illustrates this case well of why Houston. All right. So John is originally from Northern England, we go. Uh, which he describes as very tolerant of atheism. And surveys show that the UK is a pretty secular country. Uh, nearly half of Britons claim no religious affiliation, and that's um, more than double what it is in the US. Uh, so this is uh, a quote from John. 
He said religion just wasn't an issue there. I think the thing that drives me to join an organization is the simple fact that I do feel like I'm an isolated minority. And it's a safe environment to look for friends in, that's the bottom line. And if I was in the UK, I wouldn't even be thinking about it. I wouldn't even be thinking about doing this because there isn't the same discrimination there. Uh, so being an, an atheist in the United Kingdom simply isn't going to raise eyebrows like it does in the US. I've talked to a few people from the UK and I don't think any of them had even thought about labeling themselves an atheist until they came to the States because there was never really any need to do so. So religion is simply not a topic of conversation that happens very often. So there's not really much of an incentive to form a non-religious organization. All right. So from England, John then moved to Huntsville, Alabama. <laughs> so and, sorry. <laughs> and had a much different experience with religions. So this is a, another quote from John. Uh, he said, my ex-wife was also atheist, and the kids have grown up atheist, and we were definitely discriminated against as soon as the neighbors realized we weren't going to church on Sunday morning. I mean, they stopped their children playing with our children. And uh, it was very funny because the religion was so strong there, and Huntsville is not a very big place, maybe 250,000, and it was below the critical mass to create a non-theistic community. So in Huntsville, you have an environment that's very religious and hostile toward non-belief. Uh, so John talked about KKK activity in Huntsville. Uh, he talked about his, his ex-wife, who, uh, who is Mexican, being harassed in grocery stores for speaking Spanish to their children. Uh, he described it as overall a pretty intolerant place to live. Uh, so even though atheists in Huntsville may feel a need for a cohesive non-religious community, it's just too risky to come out and be visible uh, as an atheist. So Houston appears to be in this perfect place between high and low levels of secularity for non-religious uh, organizations to thrive. Uh, and I'm using secularity here pretty loosely, basically I'm referring to the overall presence and influence of religion in everyday life. So. Um, the bottom axis here, secularity, if it's lower, it's lower in Huntsville, it's more religious, less secular. It's higher, it's more secular in England. The other axis is the number of groups. So Houston has a lot more groups like this than England versus Huntsville. Uh, so Houston is, it's a big city. It's cosmopolitan, it's one of the most diverse cities in the country, racially, ethnically, culturally. So in a sense, it has to be tolerant. Uh, but at the same time, you're still in Texas. Uh, you're in the Bible Belt. Yep. <laughs> you're not too far removed from the Deep South. Uh, religion is prevalent enough that you can expect to encounter it in everyday interactions. So you might hear it in political rhetoric, or you might see it trying to make its way into the public classrooms. Uh, or you might meet someone who asks you, you know, where you go to church. Uh, so non-believers might feel like there's more of a need to organize in response to religion than they do, say, in Northern England. Um, but it's also not unsafe to do so like it is in Huntsville. So these are some of the groups that exist here uh, in Houston. These groups along the top here are the larger ones. Uh, Houston Atheists, Humanists of Houston, uh, the Houston Skeptic Society, and the Houston Oasis, which is a godless congregation, kind of like the Sunday Assembly, some of the other groups I talked about uh, earlier in the talk. Um, so HA, for instance, has over 2,700 members on the meetup page. Um, Vic had just mentioned earlier the, um, the um, Humanist of Houston meetup page. I think it's almost 1,500. I checked this morning and you're about six short of, uh, of 1,500. Um, so these are pretty large groups. And granted, this, uh, these numbers are based on online membership on meetup.com, uh, which is pretty much the site that all of these groups use to advertise their events. Uh, so not all of these people who join a meetup uh, online are necessarily going to be active. They might not be coming out um, to meetings 
often, if ever at all. Um, there's a lot of overlap in the membership between those groups, too. Um, I've been going to events in Houston, and there are you know, a, a pretty core group of people that I see pretty much everywhere. Um, there's a lot of overlap in membership. Uh, but still, this suggests that there's a pretty significant number of people in Houston who are involved in these groups um, and would consider themselves non-religious, non-believers. Uh, there are also a few smaller organizations around Houston. There's the Houston Black Nonbelievers. Uh, there's also the Houston Church of Free Thought, uh, which is another kind of godless congregation that meets once a month. Um, Americans United for the Separation of Church and State have a chapter uh, here in Houston that occasionally host uh, events. And there are a few other groups too. There's a chapter of the ex-Muslims of North America. There's a few secular parenting groups. Um, and then a few atheist humanist communities out in the far out suburbs. Um, also, you probably can't see this too closely, but just to give you an idea of what's happening in the free thought community here in Houston, for those of you who aren't familiar with groups beyond HOH, this is my calendar from the month of February. Um, so among the largest groups that I just mentioned, uh, there's something on the calendar almost every day of the week. And this also is not including my interview schedule. I had at least one or two interviews scheduled almost every day here. So there's a lot happening in Houston. All right. And I'm actually going to see. skip over a couple of these slides here. <laughs> Um, so anyway, one of the things that I'm doing in this research is kind of developing a typology of non-religious uh, organizations in much the same way that you kind of seen typologies of non-religious individuals. I guess I just passed this up here. Maybe you guys have seen this research recently, the different types of, of non-believers out there. You probably all know someone who fits into one of these categories. Um, I think this is important to be familiar with. Uh, because a lot of people have, um, the, the atheist community, uh, people who are, identify as atheists are often kind of portrayed as being a very homogenous group of people that usually fall into the anti-theist category, um, which is not necessarily the case at all. Uh, so anyway, I think if you're going to develop a typology of atheist or secular organizations, I think a really useful way to do this is to break groups down by their functions or the chief benefits that they aim to provide for their members. And of course, these are ideal types. In reality, uh, organizations might display different identities at different times. Uh, HOH, I think, does a great job of displaying all of these identities, of, of filling all of these needs for their members. Some people might take advantage of some types of events more so than others. Uh, and if you've been involved in HOH for a long time, I'm probably not going to be telling you anything that you don't already know. Um, but for those of you who are maybe new, if this is your first meeting, this uh, hopefully will give you um, an idea of what HOH is kind of about as a non-religious organization. So some of these groups and some of the events that, that Humanists of Houston um, hosts uh, might be considered primarily social in nature. Uh, so some of these organizations might value providing members with social support uh, and opportunities to socialize with like-minded others. Uh, so the bottom picture here is actually from a Houston atheist event at a dive bar called uh, Darwin's Theory. <laughs> and the HA events especially are primarily social. Uh, but HOH does do some social events too, so we have pictures here of uh, Solstice Party back in December and also uh, the uh, Women's Club that meets once a month. I have another quote from my interview respondents here for, there, there will be a few of these for emphasis. Uh, this guy that I talked to is a member of Houston Atheists. Uh, this is something that I've heard from a lot of non-believers that I've had conversations with. Uh, he said, one big thing that can make you uncomfortable if you're looking for friends and you're an atheist is, you know, if the person is religious, it's inevitably going to come up and you're going to have to deal with it. But sidestepping, skipping that whole issue is nice. It doesn't mean that you're going to like everybody or you're going to agree with everybody on political issues or anything like that, 
But that's one big topic you can avoid, which is nice. Uh, so some of these communities here in Houston might be educational, where members can learn about uh, or debate uh, the philosophical merits of atheism and the shortcomings of religion, uh, have discussions about science, politics, teach their children about world religion, science, ethics. Um, so I've talked to a lot of non-believers who are pretty happy with the social events, but others that say they, they're looking for something a little more. Uh, they they want to learn something or engage in more structured discussions. Uh, and I think this is one of the things that HOH does best. If I had to pick one category, one identity to put HOH um, into that they put on display more than any of the others, I'd probably say that HOH is an educational organization. There are all kinds of educational events on the calendar. Um, there are recurring clubs that give uh, community members the opportunity to speak about um, whatever areas of expertise they might have. So there's the Ideas Club, there's the Religion, Ethics, and Society Club. These both meet at Lou Daly's home. Um, there's the Sugarland Forum, which meets at Bob Finch's home, Sugarland. Uh, HOH also brings in guest speakers from uh, for their sponsored events. So just recently, since I've been here in Houston, uh, we've seen uh, Aaron Ra uh, has been here to give a talk. Greta Cristino is here recently. Zach Coplin and Greta Cristina. Um, here giving talks about their their areas of expertise and also HOH does a pretty good job of promoting outside events that they uh, wish to promote um, so events that might be happening um, at one of the local universities um, at a <coughs> Unitarian congregation uh, or promoting um, events of other organizations like the Houston Black Nonbelievers um, HOH has um, promoted some of these events. Another role that these groups might play is a political one. Uh, they might focus on raising awareness of church-state issues by uh, maybe initiating lawsuits against policies that could be interpreted as favoring religious uh, individuals or institutions. Uh, I've also included protest activity under this uh, category, so HOH has been involved in several protests around Houston. Uh, oh, here was another event that wasn't necessarily hosted by any of the local groups here in Houston, but was promoted by HOH, and this is the Texas Secular Convention, which was held in August, uh, in Austin, at the end of February. Um, and this included talks about um, Christian-based politics that are damaging uh, the state of Texas and how secular individuals as a coalition could go about making changes in the state legislature. And I think there were probably at least at least 15 or 20 people from HOH that I ran into at this event. Uh, Non-religious organizations might primarily be concerned with charitable endeavors, uh, so where members can volunteer and participate in charity work. Um, and there are more and more events like this going up on the HOH calendar. Uh, so Vic just mentioned a few earlier, the um, sorting medical supplies, atheists helping homeless. Uh, in fact, secular people often recognize that religious groups do this kind of thing really well. Uh, and some of the non-believers that I've encountered even volunteer through churches or religious organizations. Uh, but some non-religious organizations are recognizing that non-believers require services that they might have a hard time getting from religious organizations. Uh, so I spoke to a woman who's involved in the Houston Black Non-Believers. Uh, she said the HBN president, which I don't think is here today, uh, the HBN president and I talked about the plight of the homeless. You know, a lot of these shelters around here are Christian-based, you know, it's that beat you over the head till you become a Christian, uh, whether you are or not, and he would like something secular. Now, if you want to go to church or whatever, that's your business, we're not going to proselytize. And he said, I'm pretty sure there's some atheists out there, uh, but they have to say they're Christian in order to get services. I said, yeah, I'm pretty sure there are. 
Uh, so not only are secular charities important in that they can potentially provide non-believers in need with a place to go for, um, for what they need without the religious strings attached, uh, but they're also important because it really does help mitigate the impression that atheists are immoral or don't care about other people. Sometimes these, these groups are uh, spiritual in nature. Uh, so there is another event that HOH is helping to promote, which is read, uh, led by Daniel Stream, who's actually a previous HOH president. Uh, it's a spiritual naturalist service that involves meditation and ritualistic elements. Uh, so not all non-believers, I found, are comfortable with this term spirituality. Uh, and it seems to be a very individualistic concept in that it means a lot of different things to different people. Uh, so for example, I asked one of my interview respondents uh, if he thought there was any room for secularity, or sorry, spirituality in a secular worldview, in an atheistic worldview. And he was very enthusiastic in his response. This is one of my favorite quotes. Uh, he said, when the light bulb burns out, it's gone, and it's sad. Sort of. But it's also kind of awesome because I'm not going to live forever. I get this one chance to eat ice cream and be with people I love and check out sunsets and visit Canada, and it's great. Is there room for spirituality? Yes. I meditate. That helped me get off drugs. There's room to hold someone's hand and say, you know, I'm just thankful you're in my life, and I really love you, and I'm really thankful you're my friend. I'm thankful you're my sister. I'm thankful for all of these different things. If that's prayer, then that's prayer. And there's also room for being crass, and there's room for the banal as well. The sacred and the profane. I need both those things. I need comedy clubs where I can go and shout obscenities, and I need moments where I can reflect on just how awesome it is that I exist. All right. Start wrapping it up here. Uh, finally, one more thing I want to talk about is that a lot of these groups are communal in nature. And I actually just added this category to my typology here a few weeks ago because I started encountering events and hearing about things the groups were trying to do that didn't quite fit in to the categories that I've just talked about so far. And one of these events was actually an HOH event. It was Personal Finance 101. Is Jimmy Dunn here today? I didn't see him. Um, he hosted an event at... Um, a community center that just for about an hour people met and talked about their you know financial questions and you know difficulties and I went to this meetup and I was sitting there thinking like what exactly is this you know is this like why is this being offered by HOH it's not you know how does this activity fit into this typology that I've been thinking about it's kind of educational but not quite like the other events that I've encountered at, at HOH and some of the other, other groups uh, and what I learned is that Jimmy is also involved in a Unitarian congregation, and he did this discussion series uh, for the UU members. They liked it, so he decided to offer it to the humanists uh, as well. And so he was sharing not just information and knowledge, but a skill to members of the community. Uh, so HOH, from what I recall, I think is also funneling some of its um, donations into a compassion fund uh, to help members if they encounter problems and need financial help from the community. Uh, so this idea of community has always kind of been at the forefront of my mind since the start of this project, uh, but I've kind of been thinking about it as fulfilling more of a social need, but it's more than just social. Uh, it's, you know, you go to some of these Houston Atheist events and it's people eating and drinking and you know, looking to have conversations with some interesting people, uh, which is great, but it's also usually kind of shallow. Um, not always, but, um, you know, maybe, maybe you'll see the same people at the same location four weeks from now, uh, but maybe you won't. Uh, or I've been thinking about this need for community as kind of serving a spiritual need, but just because an organization is structured like a church or performs some of the same functions as a church doesn't necessarily mean that the group is fulfilling some sort of spiritual need in its members, at least not for all of them. Uh, but rather, these groups are striving to function as a consistent, dependable group 
uh, that you can go for, go to for help if you need it, uh, and take advantage of learning something new, of learning a new skill when it's offered. Um, and I think I will actually wrap up with this quote here, um, real quickly before I move on to my conclusion. Uh, so I interviewed this woman who summed up this sentiment really well. Uh, she said, honestly, the last thing that was holding me back from fully admitting that I didn't believe in God was the concept of community. I need church. I need a community that has my back, even if I don't know these people, right? Because I'm a part of the community, they're going to step up and help me, or they're going to be there for me, and they're going to create a sense of home for my children. Because it did that for me as a child. Church was a really fun place for me. I loved church. I loved the friends. I had a church. I loved the sports I played through church. And I was really afraid of saying, I'm not going to be a part of a church anymore. Once I realized that I could have community without God, I was gone. Okay. So wrapping up here. Um, one of the hardest questions for a lot of sociologists to answer, and for me in particular sometimes, is the so what question. Um, why is this research important? Why does it matter that non-believers are organizing? Uh, and some of the organizations host social events, and some of them invite guest speakers to talk about science or philosophy, and some of them volunteer, and some of them organize protests. Why does any of this matter? Uh, and at the end of the day, I tell myself that this is important because it affects lives. Maybe not everyone's life in the same way, uh, but people generally make a lot of assumptions about non-believers. Uh, and they're usually not positive assumptions. Uh, they're not assumptions about how good, caring, and selfless atheists are. Uh, and they make a lot of these assumptions because they don't actually know anyone who's an atheist, or they don't know that they know anyone who's an atheist. They don't know what these people are like, these people. Um, and I have talked to a, a number of people who have said that losing their faith is the hardest thing that they've ever experienced, because when you lose your religion, you don't just lose a belief in God. That's, from the conversations I've had with people, that's actually usually the easiest part. But you lose everything else that's attached to it. You lose your social circles, sometimes friends and family. You lose your routine. Uh, you lose a community that you can depend on. Uh, and that's why I think communities like HOH are so vital. People need to socialize. They want to learn new things. They want to defend their rights and uh, help each other out when they need it. And religious communities are not the only way to do this. Uh, church isn't the only way to fulfill these needs. And once, uh, it's probably been the easiest way to do it, and maybe arguably the most successful way to do it. Uh, but there needs to be viable alternatives for non-believers uh, to get these needs. And maybe it doesn't have to be with an organization like HOH, um, but I think that organizations like this will continue to grow until religion becomes such a trivial part of everyday life that these non-religious organizations that are non-religious by design no longer need to exist. And according to recent Pew data, uh, this is going to be never. Because <laughs> uh, religion's not going away. Um, they say, why Muslims are rising fastest and the unaffiliated are shrinking as a share of the world's population. Uh, so religion's not going away anytime soon. Uh, so there will likely be a place for groups like HOH uh, for a long time. Uh, so thank you very much. Alright, thank you very much, Amanda. That was an amazing presentation. And, and I'm not, not just saying that because you were so positive towards HOH. I do really appreciate that. I, I, and I had no idea that it was going to be. So, um, yeah, thank you very much uh, for that. So, yeah, we do have some time for Q&A. Um, so, our, our official end time is 3 o'clock, but really, we have until 3.30 before we have to clear out. Um, we did want to do Q&A. Also, let our treasurer, Carol Shields, do a little uh, treasurer's report. And if we have time, about a three-minute uh, surprise, that's going to be really cool. I hope we have time for it. If you do need to leave, feel free, but uh, I suggest sticking around if you can. So, um, yeah, please uh, keep your questions uh, concise and to the point and in the form of a question. So, uh, <laughs> all right, Dr. Dave. Uh, is HOH, have you found that HOH, the organization, is stigmatized in Houston? Have you interviewed 
uh, the media, the television stations, the uh, Houston Chronicle, mm -hmm. politicians, the mayor, uh, and, and other corporations and so on, to see how they regard HOH. No, I haven't, but I, I am really interested in that question. I think it's a great question. Oh, he asked if um, kind of what the perception is of HOH by maybe outsiders, by, by the community, how they regard uh, HOH as an organization, and I, I think that's a really interesting question. It's kind of outside the scope of the data that I'm collecting, but um, I mean, from what I've, I know Vic has mentioned before that there are, um, there isn't the, the interfaith community, I think, has reached out to, to HOH a few times to include uh, the non-religious, to include humanists in those conversations that involve um, religion or, or um, interfaith relationships. Um, yeah, as far as, um, yeah, I'm, I'm not really sure. Nothing negative that I've heard of. Um, I think that's, that's true. Um, also, I think, I think the term humanist is a little more accepted among the general population than the phrase atheist. So I'd imagine if there was a group that was going to receive any sort of, you know, Flack or um, you know negative emotions from the community at large. It would probably be Houston atheists for the simple fact that they have the word atheist in their name. Um, uh, humanist. I think a lot of people don't exactly know what humanism is, so um, they might not have those negative opinions of the organization if they were to hear about it. It's just my thought at the moment right now. I think skeptic society uh, has that same advantage. Mm -hmm. Yes. I've actually encountered a few uh, religious believers that are involved in the skeptic society. So I think it is mostly mostly atheists, humanists, non-believers, but, but not exclusively. Yeah, Brad. Have you gotten any feel for what percentage of the believing community is there for purely social motivations? Oh, I have no idea, but I would think that it's probably bigger than most people would imagine. I think, and I know that there has been some recent research about kind of the complications in, you know, not all people who belong believe and not all believers belong and, and things like that. So I think you, you probably have more people than you would think that are going to church strictly for the community uh, because it was how they were raised, because that's where their friends are, it's where their families are and not necessarily because they still believe in the doctrine that's being taught. <laughs> so I, I couldn't give you a precise percentage, but I think it's bigger than, than most people would think. No, I, I, you haven't, you know, it would probably be very difficult to um, interview non-believers who don't seek out I'm trying to, if any of you know of any atheists or non-believers who are not here and not involved in these groups, I'd love to contact them. I've been trying. It's really hard, though. They're hard to find. Most of us know people that yeah. Know, yeah. like that. And, mm -hmm. and so of the six functions that you mentioned, my guess is that uh, the, the people that seek out these organizations are doing it for more community mm -hmm. than anything else. Yeah. I mean, I think like these are pretty like some of these these functions, these needs that I talked about. These are pretty general, basic human needs. So if an atheist is not getting it from a group like Humanists of Houston, they're probably getting it somewhere else. Um. If I didn't misunderstand you, you indicated that 50 percent of England is sectarian, non-affiliated. Yeah, I'm pretty and sure it's about half. The U.S. is about half that. So it's about 20%. 20% yeah. of the United States are, is not affiliated. But that doesn't mean they're atheists no. or agnostic. Yeah. Um, I've, so, become very skeptical of survey research and statistics of doing, <laughs> doing this research because it's, there is not a lot of quantitative you know, survey research on there that really tells you anything informative about atheists or non-believers or non-religious people. A lot of surveys will just ask you, you know, what is your religious affiliation? Christian, Jewish, Islam, none. Like, well, what is none? That, I, I mean, that includes, they're, they're about, I think something like, you know, 75% of the people who identify as none 
still actually have some sort of belief in a higher power. Maybe it's not the Christian God, but it's you know some sort of spiritual um, belief. So most of most of the people in that chunk of people you know, still believe in in something spiritual. If I'm not mistaken, Germany has a compulsory tax if you are a Christian and belong to a church. And because a lot of people feel the freedom now to reject that, a lot of that income has dwindled uh, dramatically. Is that correct? Do you know? I don't know for sure, but I mean, that wouldn't surprise me. What do you want to do after you get your PhD? I want to teach. I want, I want to do the, the professor route, stay in academia. Um, I, I mean, pretty much if, if you're going into academia and you're going to be a professor and work in a university, you're going to have some combination of teaching and research. Um, I would prefer to lean more toward teaching. Uh, that was why I originally decided to go to graduate school. I wanted to teach at the college level. I wanted to teach. Um, I really enjoyed sociology. I probably could not handle anything under college. I just <laughs> could not do it. So I could teach at the college level. And I was like, oh, you need a PhD to do that and have any job security? Like, OK, I guess I'll get a PhD then. <laughs> so yeah. I, I'm, I plan on, and I'm really lucky at the University of Arizona, I, this is my third year teaching, um, being the instructor of record, teaching my own courses, I'm teaching sociology of religion right now, and it's, um, it's been really fun and enjoyable, and um, the fall I'm teaching religion again, but then next spring I'm teaching in the classroom, I'm teaching a course on non-religion and secularism, and I'm really excited about that. Yeah, Paul. Oh. Um, it seems a couple of hotbeds of atheism in America are certain careers that have identity, like academics or journalists. And back when I was uh, taking sociology classes, uh, I decided that um, religious identity was a lot of it to give you a way of moving to the new community and having uh, some way to vouch for yourself. You're a good person because you're religious. <laughs> and that, that's a particular role in the States because we're so mobile. People move between communities. So do you think that this community, communal aspect of organizations like HOH will continue? It could be more pronounced in the States, even if we become more secular compared to, say, Europe and other places where people move around. Yeah, maybe. I think that's a great point because re religious communities have always kind of been like this de facto, like if you get up and move, there's a community there that, that you can go to. If, if you get up and you know, you're visiting another state, visiting another city, there's a church there that you can go to. And, and that's assuming that you're a Christian. That's, I think, one, one of the um, elements of Christian privilege is that you can travel around and go to, go to different cities and different you know, states, and you can probably find a congregation that fits uh, your beliefs. Um, so that they're kind of like these ready-made, you know, homes where you can integrate into. And I think for non-religious people, yeah, I think communities like HOH would be really important in providing that. And I can't think of a better alternative that's not a church, um, you know, a better secular alternative that is doing that kind of thing for non-believers. Could you say what your funding source is for the work? Oh yeah, I um, so a couple of small grants um, from uh, the um, Social and Behavioral Sciences Research Institute at the U of A, so that's an internal grant, and then I also have a small grant from the Society for the Scientific Study of Religion. Um, so those are my two funding sources. For and um, I've been kind of lucky that I haven't really needed more than that because, and like I said, I'm teaching online at the U of A, so that's my income. Um, my roommate in Tucson is also renting out my room there, so I'm not paying double rent. <laughs> so that's, that's really nice. So I've been really fortunate in that I was able to just pick up and travel and go somewhere where I thought um, it would be a really interesting site to do this kind of research. I have a yeah. question, Nancy. Question is, you said Houston was the perfect middle ground because it was like a sizable format. What would number two, three, and four on the Oh, uh, there was no like, um, it was just kind of an example of, um, you know, taking this case of this person I interviewed who I think had this story that really illustrated this idea that the really secular places don't have a lot of organizations because they don't really need them, and the really religious places 
don't have a lot of secular organizations because either the atheists aren't there or they don't want to be open. It's not safe to be open. So Houston was kind of in the middle where you're, you know, a big city, you're cosmopolitan, uh, but you're also, you know, Bible belty. So um, you kind of have that mix. So as a result, you see more of these groups kind of cropping up. Well, I can, I can kind of chime in there a little bit. Oh, well, just um, when, when I was looking into the largest uh, other organizations of our kind and uh, of all the meetup groups, um, the next largest groups uh, in no particular order, Phoenix, Arizona, which well, would have been a lot closer, um, <laughs> Oklahoma City, and um, well, the Bay Area, which is very liberal, but very large uh, liberal population, so it kind of goes against. and. Um, what was the next? Oh, well, and I mentioned before Minnesota, which I think it's specifically Minneapolis, Minnesota. So it's not like a hard and fast rule, but a general trend. And my statement was actually a suggestion I want to include your thought. It's that none of this should be surprising, to your point, because after all, 100 years ago, England did send us all religious nuts and people. Tends to be more religious than you know Western Europe. A lot of other com uh, countries pull out that. That might be one of the reasons. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So my question is more towards you as a non-religious person. How has it felt for you to come from Tucson, where you didn't have as much of access to communities, and what have you experienced here? This being different. Um, well, Tucson has, they do have a, they have a few communities in, in Tucson. Um, there's the, the Tucson Atheists, which I joined three years ago when I started my MA research um, as a, a site to recruit people to interview. And at the time, I think that had about 400 members on Meetup. Today, I think it's about 900. Um, so it's more than doubled in just the last few years. Um, I mean, that community is growing, and, and they do offer, you know, maybe there's events on the calendar once or twice a week. Um, um, but they're not quite as varied as it is here in Houston. Like, when I look at, you know, I'm a, a member of all these groups on Meetup, and that's like every day there's, you know, at least one or, or multiple events happening that are, you know, that, that kind of fulfill these different functions. So if you're the type of person who's looking for, you know, I'm an atheist, I really want to volunteer, I don't want to do it with a, you know, religious organization, let me look into, you know, HOH and see what they're doing. Um, and, and maybe those are the types of events that you're drawn to and you're not really interested in the other things that HOH are do, uh, is doing. So um, I think because there's just that diversity here, which I haven't seen, um, both in Tucson and even just looking at meetup pages around, you know, different cities around the country, seeing like what's actually happening here. Um, so, for instance, I went back to Indiana um, last summer and, and figured like, oh, I'll spend some time in Chicago, going to you know the different secular groups in Chicago. There's bound to be a lot of stuff happening there. And there really wasn't. There was, you know, maybe a couple, you know, maybe one or two large groups, a few other like groups kind of scattered around the suburbs and. It maybe have one event posted every month, and yeah, there was just not not a whole lot happening in, in that scene. Um, and of all the places I looked into, and you know, kind of those liberal you know hotbeds. You know, we talk about like San, like mentioned San Francisco has a really large community, but also you know Seattle, Por uh, Portland, Boston. Um, a lot of these communities, those groups are there and they're large and they have things on the calendar. But Houston just stood out as having so much, and it was really incredible. Trisha. Do you have a sense of um, how your students are leaning? I'm, I'm very interested in young people and how they're uh, following those, these paths. Yeah, um, so my students in my Sociology of Religion course, um, they tend to be pretty open about their, their religious uh, beliefs. A lot of them will say, like, I'm an atheist or I don't believe, or a lot of them uh, will say, I wasn't raised with anything. So uh, they might not call themselves an atheist, but they're just secular. Um, I think the data shows that about um, a third of people under the age of 30 are not affiliated, at least. Um, so it's definitely a trend that's more prevalent among younger people. Um, I've you know, just thinking about some of the things my students say and like their discussion comments. I'm, I'm not in the classroom, so it's hard to, to 
get a sense of the things that they talk about online, um, they tend to seem, or maybe they're just you know, putting on the space because they don't want to you know, be ostracized or get a lower grade or something, but um, they tend to seem pretty accepting, pretty, you know, I might believe this, but someone else shouldn't be penal penalized or discriminated against for believing something else. Um, I'd say that's probably the overwhelming feeling that I get from you know, college age students. Do you have any believer students? Oh yeah, yeah, people that you know will talk about you know they were raised Catholic and they'll say oh, I you know I stopped going. No, not you know, work, but are oh, believers. Are. are believers? Yes. And I mean, they're yeah, believers and they're in your class. Yeah, I, I'd imagine so. Yeah. <laughs> you just don't say it. Yeah, well, they'll um, yeah they'll talk about like going to church and believing in God and and I've very I, I haven't I can't think of any examples where I've had a student you know really say really like you know, bigoted yeah. things or, or something like that. But, you don't have to do that. But I mean, I as far as just believing in God, what yeah. The atheist view is, yeah. You know, mm -hmm. or pure academic. Mm -hmm. <coughs> One, one, one example that uh, incorporates, I think, non-believers uh, is creating community uh, as people get older, uh, and actually even communal living uh, in some cities. But I mean, you mentioned like Portland, Oregon, and, and Boulder, Colorado. And there's different places where that is really strong. And I think some of the non-believer um, atheist uh, thinking and support is in those organizations. Mm -hmm. as opposed to standalone humanist organizations, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. So you're saying that just communal groups of people in general that yeah, don't... Yeah, they're not religious mm -hmm. in that way, but, but, yeah. but they incorporate a lot of the social community. Oh, yeah. Yeah, like I mentioned, you know, there are a lot of places to get, you know, your, your social, you know, learning, political needs met. It doesn't have to be a non-religious non organization, but... It's just one avenue that's available for Well, uh, considering that uh, you've limited your studies to uh, history, uh, do you see that also placing a limit on how generalizable the conclusions are? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's always an issue in this type of research, um, is how, like, if I find these things are happening in Houston, how likely is it that they're also happening, you know, somewhere else? Absolutely. And that was, I mean, that was one of the things that that, you know, starting out this research and really developing it, that I had a lot of conversations about with my committee was, you know, do I stay in Houston? Do I want to go to, you know, two or three different cities and do a comparison? Um, and it was ultimately decided that it would probably be a better use of time to stay in one location and get to know it really well rather than you know after six months picking up and going um, going somewhere else and starting from scratch again in another community um, i think if this wasn't dissertation research that would be something i would really want to do but because you know i'm kind of on a, a time limit you know they're, they're they want us to finish our dissertations and get out of the department you know they don't want us to spend you know two or three years collecting data um, but I, I think because Houston in particular is so diverse and has a lot of these organizations, I think it'll be easier to see the range of the groups that exist, the types of, of activities people are drawn to, their reasons for becoming involved in these groups. Um, I think that it'll be clearer here than it might be in other locations. Um, and even just what I've noticed here, comparing with what I've seen in Tucson, um, people don't have significantly different experiences that I've seen um, between like something like Tucson and, and Houston. Um, but no, the, the generalizability is, is always an issue to work around. Because um, even if you reach certain conclusions, do they really matter if you can't you know, say this is something that might be happening in other places too?